Hello to this candidate night. <laughs> My name is Roque Sanchez and I am a, a member of Family with Power and also a, a Jackson Tree School counselor. Um, welcome to our meet the candidate night for the mayor and city council at large elections. We especially like to thank you, you for coming in this difficult night after going through the uh, power outage and, and um, and survive the storm and all, all those difficult moments that we have in the last few days. Um, I am glad to see you. Uh, um, we welcome you to tonight's program, which organized, which was organized. <laughs> Maybe because, maybe because I, st I stopped talking. <laughs> there you go. Oh, okay. There you go. Anita has a little storm-related announcement about oh. food stamp replacement, so I'll just ask her to come in and do it. Yeah, she can come and do it right now. Um, we, we welcome you to tonight's program, which, which, which is organized by Casa Latina and Family Power. Um, here's our format. I hope you have a chance to meet the candidates and pick and pick up uh, campaign literatures before sitting down. Um, we, will, we will first ask question of the mayor of the mayor. Uh, we first we will first ask question of the mayoral candidates until 7 p.m. and then the city council candidate and then to the city council candidate until 8 p.m. Um, we will start out with some questions from our members and then include some questions from the, can from the audience as time allows. If you would like to ask a question, please write on a card. Do we have any car cards? Yes, they were out here. I'll bring them in. I'll just set them on this table here so if you want them. Uh, you can write in Spanish or English and, and, pass it, and pass it to me. Include your name and if you want to ask Ask it to the to the candidates for your for mayor or council city council. The candidates will introduce themselves and give a closing statement. For each question, they will have two minutes to answer. And the option of a one minute rebuttal. Now I would like to I would like to introduce Gia Bernini and Heather Warner from Casa Latina, who will co who will co facilitate tonight. And uh, um, and, um no, Elba. Uh, who will be our timekeeper? Gia. Hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Heather Warner. I'm a co-president of Casa Latina. And Casa Latina provides support um, to Latino families um, and um, families where English is not their first language throughout Hampshire County. And it's a very small organization that does a tremendous amount of work. Um, we are looking for board members, so if anybody is interested, please talk to me afterward. Um, and I am really pleased to introduce the candidates tonight. Um, I, for one, have not been to a debate yet, and I'm really interested to uh, hear what they have to say about these particular questions that are near and dear to my heart. And we have two really um, capable candidates, and we're very fortunate in our area to have um, you know, a competition where we have such great choices, um, both of you. So I'd like to introduce Michael Bardsley and David Narkowitz. So to begin with, my name is Gia Bernini and also um, a board member now at Casa Latina. You guys can take those two seats right oh, good. there. Thank you. Um, so Elba is going to begin by asking the first question. Elba, I'm okay. <laughs> Do you want me to stand up? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I'm one of the residents from Hampshire Heights. And um, what first point is, is um, many of our kids, in, um, it's embarrassed by living in Hampshire Heights because the way it looks. Um, we need playgrounds for our children and a decent basketball court for our youth. As the next mayor, what will you do to improve living condition at Hampshire Heights and Florence Heights. And before answering that question, you may introduce yourselves. I skip that section. If you'd like to. Okay. Just In terms of going to a 
prepared introductions? Or yes. Just a, sorry. Yeah. Okay. We, yeah. So we, they, we're they, going to back yeah. up a little. Bit. We're going to back up one second <laughs> and let each candidate introduce themselves formally, and then we'll go back to the question. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, I want to thank uh, Families with Power and uh, Casa Latina for sponsoring this uh, forum. And I also want to, I hope I don't embarrass her, but um, I take a, a lot of uh, uh, pride and to see uh, Heather, because Heather and I have a connection that goes way back. Heather was a, a former student of mine when in the beginning of my teaching career, it's way back in Amherst. So it's yeah. great to see Heather. So great. Thank you, Heather. A student. I was a student, yeah. yes. Yeah, we went to school great. together. Um, a brief little snapshot of uh, uh, me for those of you who may not know me. I was born in Lawrence, Massachusetts to a working class family. Um, my mother is an immigrant, a war bride from uh, World War II. I came out to UMass area in the 60s, moved to Northampton in the 70s. I have spent uh, 33 years as a professional in the public schools, classroom teacher, guidance counselor, administrator. Uh, over 20 years in a local government and I've had a lot of community leadership um, experience, especially around human and civil rights and uh, uh, public education, ensuring um, equity and excellence uh, for uh, education of our children. Um, for those of you who want more information, I have a brochure and I have also have a Spanish translation of it, and that's out at the, uh, the table. You can find that if you want. Uh, more information on me, and I think it's really interesting to compare and contrast the information on the two candidates were very different. Um, what I feel is relevant for you to know is I am a compassionate listener. I am a people person. I can relate to those who come from different circumstances than mine. I am a tireless advocate for those whose uh, needs are not being met by the institutions who have uh, been given those responsibilities. And I'm a public servant. I have no personal agenda in this race other than to do what is good for the community. And as you hear tonight's uh, discussion, I hope you'll be able to determine that for yourselves. And thank you very much for being here this evening. Hi everybody, my name is uh, David Narkowitz. I also want to thank uh, Casa Latina and Families with Power for putting together tonight's event. Um, just a little bit about my background. I was born here in western Massachusetts, uh, of, a, of a large uh, working class family of nine kids, um, and uh, went, to, uh, went to high school and, and uh, after high school joined the Air Force, uh, served in the Air Force, and then came back to Western Mass to go to UMass. I was a student at UMass and uh, graduated with a degree in political science. Uh, went to Washington, D.C. after college and worked on Capitol Hill as a legislative assistant. Uh, and then um, after four years in Washington, came back and worked for John Olver here in Western Mass, uh, working on economic development in, uh, in communities across Western and Central Mass as his economic development director. Um, I took a time out from my professional career to, uh, to stay at home and raise my two daughters. Um, and during that time, I really got immersed in the community. Um, both in my school, the, my daughter's schools, they went to Bridge Street and they're now at JFK, as well as getting involved in various community organizations, including uh, the Northampton Education Foundation, which I've been a board member of for about 12 years. Um, and then uh, got more involved and served on city boards, the, uh, the Transportation and Parking Commission, the Zoning Board, and in 2005 I ran for city councilor from Ward 4 and was elected by my neighbors to serve, uh, to serve in that capacity in 2009. I became the counselor at large and council president. Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the things that I've done, I've, I've tried to really work with people across the city on a number of important issues, uh, whether it's transportation, economic development, education, energy, the budget, uh, and just making our government more open and accessible. Um, I've tried to work on programs that keep our community safe and strong. Um, I've learned the nuts and bolts of how our city functions and understand and appreciate the challenges that we face as a community. Um, I believe that my experience at the federal, state, and local level, uh, combined with my record of volunteering in the community and really being involved in the community, has prepared me to lead Northampton as your next mayor. And I believe I have a vision and a proven record of leadership 
uh, and results that can help move our great city forward. So I appreciate the opportunity to be with you tonight and, uh, and look forward to the conversation. So, would you mind reading the question again? Um, many of our kids are embarrassed to say they live in Hampshire Heights because of how it looks. We need playgrounds for our children and a decent basketball court for our youth. As the next mayor, what will you do to improve living condition at Hampshire Heights and Florence Heights? We're going to have David answer the question first. Okay. That's a great so, question. I don't know, we don't. Two minutes? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Ready? Okay. <laughs> that, well, that's a great question. Um, I was, uh, I was a, a basketball gym rat as a kid. I loved to play hoops, and obviously that's a really important part of, of growing up is having a great place to play and a safe place to play and great playgrounds. And I know um, Jackson Street gets used a lot in that capacity, but, but I, I think that is really important to, if you're living in a place to have uh, a safe place for children to play. In terms of working on that issue, I know that uh, that is a property um, the Northampton Housing Authority would be the vehicle for trying to work on making those improvements. Um, and, and we have a housing authority which is appointed by the mayor. Um, so that would certainly be something that I could try to work with as mayor, to work with the housing authority, to work with, uh, to work with the, the, um, the folks on site, to try to figure out are there ways we can improve the facilities? Um, are there ways we can try to seek funding uh, to, to make the improvements necessary so that we can have safe space for our kids to play? Uh, and to enjoy uh, sports or, or just swinging on a swing. So I think that's a really important thing, and, and I'd be committed to working with you and, and the community and the housing authority to try to, to try to address that issue. Thank you. Michael? Um, no one should be embarrassed uh, about where they live, and if that is um, how people are feeling about um, uh, where they live in public housing, it suggests to me that there's a failure of those who have that responsibility uh, to provide for the people living in that housing. Um, the, in terms of what I would do as mayor, um, the first thing I would do is to meet with the residents and to get an understanding of their specific concerns. Um, I don't really believe in doing things for people. I, I'm sort of from the empowerment approach, so I would work with them so we could do it together and a part of that would be going through the process and meeting with the director and meeting with the board if, if necessary but um, I'm, I'm very much a person who is an advocate um, I can be very outspoken as some people in this room know um, when I feel like it's necessary and I would advocate uh, for, for the people to make sure that their needs are filled so there is an environment in which they um, take some uh, pride in, uh, in living. Um, I have, uh, in the last couple of years, even since I've been off the council, I've had uh, several phone calls, I would say almost a dozen, from residents living in various um, public housing units around concerns. And these have been individual concerns, uh, whether it's been mold in an apartment or harassment by an employee. And I have uh, met with those uh, folks and I have advocated for them and worked through the process. And there are a lot of uh, concerns uh, that need to be addressed. And um, so I, have, uh, I would have no problem in meeting with the residents and starting from there and, and looking up specific issues as well as policy changes. So, thank you. Okay. You have a minute for rebuttal. No. No. That's okay. okay. Yeah. So, Anita and Casatina, would you like to tell us the, the next question? Yes. Well, as it's easy to see, I am a person of color. <laughs> and I have been in this community for, for 18 years, and I have two boys that are in school right now. And I have been in Casa Latina for 11 years, so I know a lot of people from the Latino community. And I have heard from the Latino community a lot of uh, concerns regarding these questions that I'm going to question that I'm going to ask you people of color especially men of color are stopped and questioned by police while walking or driving more frequently than other residents what would you do to address this situation Michael would you like to begin well the, the first thing that uh, 
that I would do is I would uh, talk to the uh, the police department. I don't know if that's the first thing, but one of the things I would do would be talking to the police department because it seems to me that um, for the, for that to occur, that people are working out of stereotypes, and that is a problem. If there are police officers who have stereotypes and they are working out of those stereotypes, that tells me that there is a a, a need for education, a change of attitude, and a change of behavior. Um, I've worked in the, uh, the public schools for um, over three decades, and I have uh, dealt with similar issues with uh, faculty and dealing with a wide range of students, students of color, students from uh, different cultural backgrounds, students who are lesbian and gay. And um, we live in a diverse uh, community, but uh, people do not necessarily have a wide range of experiences in dealing with people who are diverse. And they, again, was, well, um, there's a lot of uh, racism and classism in our society, and as well um, as, uh, as uh, sexism, and we need to um, address those, those issues. I mean, they, they infect people. They, they um, uh, affect how people look at people and how they interact, and that's wrong when somebody's in a position of authority. So that's what, that would be the first thing. And I would also meet with the community to listen to their experiences and what it's like for them to go through that. And hopefully at some point in time we could have a, a meeting of, of the, uh, the groups or the individuals where we could address that and to really get an effective change in um, personal behavior and then if need be, uh, our policies. So that's what I would do. Um, Definitely that, that, uh, that would not be the kind of conduct that we would want to tolerate um, in the Northampton Police Department. And, and, uh, and I think it would be something that, um, first of all, meeting with, with folks who've, who've um, felt that they've been treated this way, I think would be a first step in terms of meeting and trying to hear those concerns and understand them and understand the context of them. Um, and then secondly, trying to, uh, trying to um, uh, uh, meet with police department talk to them about the situation and relay some of these incidents uh, to try to get a better understanding and then hopefully try to bring people together to discuss them to get a better understanding. Um, we have a police department that's one of the few in the state that's accredited so they have to go through a lot of training and they have to be certified and there's a number of, of protocols and, and I know that among them is this issue of, of not, you know, not um, uh, uh, doing racial profiling. Um, and so I think that would be one of the things we'd have to revisit is those, those policies as well and, tr and try to stress those. But I do think um, bringing people together and talking about the issue and getting a better understanding. And if we need to address it, um, if there's a particular individual that's, that's perpetrating this or if there's some systemic thing that needs to be addressed, uh, we, we would want to do that. Um, this, this issue has come up in, in, an, in another context. Um, we, earlier this year, I worked on a, on a measure to uh, around the Secure um, Communities uh, Program, which is a federal immigration program, and one of the aspects of that is this idea of, of, um, of targeting immigrant populations and, uh, and, and uh, in terms of stopping them and arresting them and creating issues around possible deportation. And I was really proud of the community uh, for not unanimously supporting a resolution, including our police chief unanimously supporting a resolution to oppose the Secure Communities Act and to not participate in it. So I know our police department um, is aware of this issue and concerned about it, and I would want to have a dialogue with you and with folks who've been affected by it and the police department. Thank you. Any for rebuttal? Um, not so much a rebuttal, but I, I just want to emphasize that in dealing with an issue like this, the responsibility for change comes from the top. Um, you can't uh, expect the people who are being victimized to be responsible for making the changes and educating people. You can't expect the change to come from the bottom or the middle uh, of those who are in charge. It really needs to come from the top and saying this is, will not be tolerated. Um, I'll make a, a comparison to the issue of bullying in, in the public schools. And it, that um, flourishes, if that's the right term, 
in schools where there isn't a, uh, a firm message coming down that this is inappropriate behavior. This will not be tolerated. And when that message is coming down and from a superintendent, it goes into the building principals, it goes into classroom teachers, and the message is very, very clear. And But if, you, if there isn't a clear message coming down, then that's where uh, you have people who are doing uh, behaviors that are, are inappropriate and not, are not acceptable. I guess my only follow-up is in case it wasn't clear, you know, as mayor I would not tolerate uh, racial profiling um, in our community and, and would, uh, would address it swiftly. Okay. Um, he has a question? Yes, this is in conjunction with the police department. The ladies have been uh, talking about the police. What are we going to do about the suicides that continue to take place in, the, in our town? Nice, a very lovely lady <coughs> her life 11 days ago on her birthday. She lived in the apartment on Pomeroy Terrace. Police were aware that she had problems. She, was, she had uh, definite interaction with the police. And, and people were informed that she needed help, and no one came and gave her any help whatsoever until after she died. Would you like to respond? I guess if we go in sequence, we can yeah. first. Um, I'm, I, I'm not familiar with the, with the circumstances of this case. It sounds Well, you wouldn't be because there's no communication between you. Okay, yeah, I, I just, I'm just saying. That's state of affairs, I agree, I agree with you. Yeah, I'm just saying I don't know the specifics of it, but it, um, but it sounds like this is a person who had reached, who tried to reach out for help, and I'm not sure what what kind of, um, you know, help was given and whether there were social services or other things that were made available to her. I'd have to, I guess I'd have to talk to you about it to know the specifics of it to be able to, to, be able to comment on it. Um, but obviously if, if there's folks who reach out for assistance and need assistance, um, I know that our, you know, police department is committed to providing that. I just don't know the individual circumstances here to be able to comment on it. But thank you. Yeah, we don't know all this. Uh, in my career as a public school educator, and I was head of the uh, guidance department and uh, Amherst Regional, and dealt with suicide issues and uh, threats of suicide uh, quite often. There were um, uh, many, many incidences uh, throughout the course of the year, and we had a, a protocol that we followed. Um, it's hard to know in, in the situation that you refer to exactly what all the uh, specifics are and if there's things that could be done. But I think one of the things we need to do in the wake of a tragedy like this is to evaluate um, uh, what, what could have been done differently, uh, what wasn't done, uh, di who knew, who didn't know, um, so we can avoid the mistakes from happening again. I think we need to learn some lessons and I think all too often things are sort of covered up, people don't think about it, they move on and we don't uh, learn the lessons and then they, therefore they repeat themselves. Um, and again, I'll talk to you if you want to after the meeting to get some of the specifics. But I do think that uh, there needs to be a protocol and again, if the police were involved, they need to know what to do in a situation like that, what the resources are, and so there can be a more effective interaction. I just want to remind people, if you have a question for the candidates, please just jot it down over here rather than interrupting the flow of questions. If we can just stick to that. And then if you have a question, just give it to me, and then we'll include as many of those as we can. We just are trying to keep to a time frame with the and candidates. you're up next, Mary. So um, we at uh, Casa Latina and Families with Power really appreciate the way the health department has taken the initiative to collaborate with other departments and community organizations to get more healthy food into our schools and our community, like the new Jackson Street Farmers Market at Hampshire Heights this summer. It was a great collaboration between local farmers, city health department, the housing authority, Families with Power, Casa Latina. Um, can you tell us what you have done and what you would do to support and promote more of this kind of collaboration between city departments and community organizations? 
Um, I, I did a lot of uh, community uh, collaboration and my uh, professional responsibilities were over in, uh, when I worked in the public schools. Um, we did that in terms of uh, support services that are out in the uh, community, um, other educational options. I had students who were attending classes at community colleges and um, uh, doing internships and a whole wide range of experiences. So I'm, I'm very uh, used to um, community collaboration, uh, making contact with those institutions and individuals uh, in the, uh, the area. Um, in terms of Northampton, um, I have worked with uh, individuals. Uh, what comes to mind is some individuals who live in McDonald House. Um, they do a lot of uh, um, uh, collaboration out in the, uh, the community to bring food back in, fresh food, back into McDonald House and do a free uh, uh, distribution of that. And I have, um, have worked with them in terms of uh, helping them uh, uh, do those activities. So uh, there's a wide range of um, opportunities here for doing that. I think that is something that we uh, need to continue to look at um, uh, for the future. Um, uh, the, uh, the experience that we went through this past weekend with the, with the storm, it was a um, kind of a uh, atypical emergency situation. Um, but I th using that as a metaphor, I think we're going to have more and more instances where we have atypical emergencies challenging our communities. And I think the response to that is to build tighter networks within the community. So we have neighbors supporting neighbors. We know what the resources are. And that is something I definitely will work with in building that sort of support system within our, uh, within our community. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, ben Wood, our city's new health director, is uh, really excellent and has been doing a lot of outreach programs uh, and, and the example of, of, of working with the, uh, the, the Friday market um, here and, and uh, is a great one. And I know that uh, um, he's also reaching out to other communities, uh, other school communities uh, around other healthy initiatives for kids in particular, which is really important that we, uh, that we teach our kids healthy habits and give them access to, to healthy foods. In terms of my experience with uh, sort of community collaboration and, and community government collaboration, um, one of the main ones I've been involved in has been around neighborhood traffic safety. And uh, as the chair of the Transportation and Parking Commission, put together a program, a sort of a, a neighborhood-based program for um, working with individual neighborhoods that wanted to deal with traffic pro uh, problems, whether it was speeding or unsafe uh, sidewalks or, or lack of crosswalks or those kinds of things. Um, and we really created kind of a collaborative uh, neighborhood-driven model. Um, it's actually a great example of that outside, the, outside of the school here. Uh, the traffic calming program uh, was a collaboration between parents here at, at Jackson Street School that were concerned about the safety of, uh, of students. And they came to the city through the Transportation and Parking Commission. And we worked with them with, um, to plug them into engineers. Uh, and then they were able to apply for grants, um, put together a program to design some of the improvements outside. And then when the stimulus monies were available, we were actually able to fund them. So it was a great collaboration between parents here um, who were concerned about their, their school safety and, and having safe routes to school and the city, and then trying to build on that collaboration to involve the state and the federal government as well. So I think that's a, a good example. And, and those kinds of collaborations have happened in neighborhoods all across the city. Um, so that's, I think that's an example of how the city can work with neighborhoods, with communities within the city, um, as well as other organizations to kind of work collaboratively to solve problems and, and, uh, and, and move forward on issues that we all have shared concerns around. Thank you. Okay. Um, now we would like to invite the audience uh, to we'll read their questions. Um, these two, perhaps you can together because those are kind of related. Okay, sure. Um, okay, how, now let's see, I'm trying to think of how to ask these together. Should I read, should I read them all? Maybe read both of them. Okay, so, 
Um, based on the demographic numbers shown in the city website, about 90% of the city's population is white. Also based on information provided by the City of Northampton Human Resource Department, only 1.2% of the city's workers identify as people of color. My question is twofold. How are you planning to outreach to the non-white population to learn about their needs, and why are there so few people of color working in, for city government, and what would you do to create more employment opportunities for these constituencies? Um, currently, I'll just read the second part now. Currently, the police department does not include Latinos or Hispanics in their demographic records as a racial category. This means that um, according to the police department, no Latino or Hispanic are arrested or stopped in this city. Um, the uh, pre preserving civil rights. The preserving our civil rights campaign is gathering structures for an un or, uh, new signatures. Oh, signatures. Sorry, maybe you should read that. Okay. Read right. the, our civil rights <laughs> campaign is gathering signatures for an ordinance that would correct this. Do you support the ordinance? Thank you. So I think it's your turn. Okay. So both of those questions. Wait, wait, just do them no. one at a time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was okay. going to say, that's going to be a yeah. tight two minutes. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so two minutes. The first one, one just about the diversity okay. and hiring. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, definitely. Um, Definitely, I, I would be committed as mayor to trying to reach out to, to um, and, and create a, a, as diverse uh, an administration as I could to try to bring people into city government from all communities across the city. Um, and that includes, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of, of positions on volunteer boards on the city, um, people who make decisions about um, zoning, about land use, about traffic, about all those kinds of issues. And I think it would, it's, it's really important that uh, we have, we have a, diversity of reflected in in, uh, in those boards so I would one of the things I would do is really be aggressive about reaching out to the community um, to try to let people know about the opportunity to serve on those kinds of uh, committees and I would try to work with organizations like Casa Latina and, and Families with Power to let them know about those opportunities and try to get um, people uh, involved and understand more about those uh, those boards and try to see if we could get more people involved to serve on them um, in terms of hiring, obviously um, we want to make sure that we're um, conducting hiring processes that, uh, that um, reach out again to all kinds of candidates and, and we want to have people um, apply, uh, people of color um, uh, apply especially and, and try to make sure that we give them an opportunity to, uh, to, to compete for those jobs and really try to reach out proactively. Uh, to let people know about those job opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, we, we right now we advertise our jobs in sort of a central register. Um, we, we put them in sort of the traditional newspapers. I think one of the things we may want to look at is trying to put um, job openings in some of the more non-traditional um, uh, uh, places so that people um, uh, of color could have maybe better access to seeing those job listings and those job opportunities. So that may be one thing we could do. Uh, to try to, to reach out, but I would be committed to um, uh, to um, making sure that we are um, hi have a very open hiring process, and that we would try to have um, as diverse us uh, uh, city employee um, uh, as possible. Do you need any re refresher on the question, Michael? Uh, no, not okay. on that question. Um, I think that's indicative in terms of the uh, having a virtually all white uh, um, uh, employees uh, staffing the, the city services. I think that's indicative of um, the people of color as well as other populations not feeling connected with uh, city government. Um, and that's something that I hear quite a bit. So I think one of the issues, as I think David wrote, or, uh, reflected on, is having people aware of. Um, what the city government does, we need to do an aggressive um, outreach. We need to talk about our committees, get people, I think you'll see, are virtually all white uh, committees too as well. So that is a problem. I think we have to identify that as a problem and then take those measures. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's a lot more than just outreach. It reminds me of the, the issue around the achievement gap in uh, public schools. And 
you can put uh, some students of color in um, public schools and do some programming there, and that doesn't necessarily solve the issue unless those folks are really convinced that they um, that uh, the folks who are working with them are really invested in them and want them to achieve. They, what there is is sort of like a trust level or a confidence level in there. And, and, and we need to send the message to folks that we really want you involved in our city. We, this is your city. It's not our city. It's your city. And we need to go out there and give that message to, to them. And um, I, I think that's going to take a lot of dialogue and a lot of trust building because I think currently the trust is in there. So are we doing the one minute follow up? Would you like to do this? Do either of you? I don't need it. Okay. Okay. So we have another, maybe two questions from the audience? Was there a second part? Part two. Okay. Part B on that question? I don't, the demographics of the police. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I know. But, um, so, um. We're professionals at this now. We've done <laughs> yes. so many okay. to go <laughs> um, So then the second question was, um, I think it was this about the, do you right. support the ordinance? The civil rights campaign is gathering signature for an ordinance that would um, correct this, um, that is to have a more equal hiring and um, so on. No, racial, no. Racial, racial, racial Oh, this is the racial, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this okay. <laughs> So, based on, the based on demographic numbers, okay, sorry about that. Based on demographic numbers shown in the city website, about 90% of the city's population. No, 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 no. no you mixed us up. We were right. <laughs> yeah. are not no, this is about the police department. Yeah. The person who asked the question just be able to ask it. Oh, that's a good yeah. option. Yeah. I know who where is she the is. Mm -hmm. Molly. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Okay. Currently, the police department does not include Latinos or Hispanics in their demographic records as a racial category. This means that according to the police department, no Latinos or Hispanics are arrested or stopped in this city. The Preserving Our Civil Rights campaign is gathering signatures for an ordinance that could correct this, that would correct this. Do you support the ordinance? Thank you. Well, I haven't seen the uh, specific ordinance, but I do um, uh, support the goal of uh, addressing, um, as we talked about earlier, uh, those um, uh, incidents where people are being uh, stopped unnecessarily because of uh, their the perception on of their uh, race. Um, so I am, uh, would support any measures that are necessary and that would help move us forward in, in dealing with this. So I would look at the specifics of the ordinance, I would sit down, I would uh, uh, meet with the, uh, the, the police chief, I would meet with um, others involved in this, I would meet with the Human Rights Commission um, and uh, come up with a, uh, an ordinance that would effectively um, uh, try to address this problem, and if it's a matter of keeping better uh, statistics, uh, de better demographic information, then that's what we need to do. Um, and I, I have a history of working on human and civil rights. I am the person who took the lead as city councilor uh, bringing in our Human Rights Commission. I est helped establish that here in this uh, city, and that's, a, I think, a proven record you can look at. Um, and so I would uh, definitely, um, I also was a city councilor who uh, took uh, the lead in the, uh, the resolution against the Patriot Act. So I would definitely um, uh, step up and take the lead around that. Yeah, so um, I, I'm familiar with this issue, not the specific ordinance that's been put forward, but this was a conversation that started around the Secure Communities Act um, debate. Um, What's at issue is, and this is actually was a problem with our national <coughs> census as well, is that um, we look at race, we, uh, we, we have all the different race categories, but Hispanic, um, Latino, Hispanic is considered ethnicity. So there's a different category. So that, there's a disconnect, and this was a problem on our census as well, 
um, they ended up in the last census adding another question um, to ask in addition to race about this issue of are you do you identify as Hispanic, Latino, whatever the question was. Um, and this same glitch, glitch occurs because our police department has these federal reporting forms when they do traffic stops that only list race categories and they do not consider Hispanic as a race so that in, we have this weird anomaly where no one who's Hispanic has been stopped. So I think the, the solution is to try to fix within, the, within our computer system, try to do the same fix that we've done at the census, which is to create this, add this as an option so that when officers make a stop, in addition to doing the race, they can also make this, uh, this distinction around ethnicity as well. And I think that would solve the problem, whether it has to be done by ordinance or not. It, I've actually had a conversation, a preliminary one, with the police chief about this and about is there a way we could correct this in the computer reporting system. Because again, the police are using a standardized form that police are using all around the state, and it has this same weird glitch that we had with our census. So that's really the problem, uh, and that's how we need to fix it. So then when we do collect data or want to show people data on how many people are being stopped of different um, racial categories, we can also then include uh, this, this other category so that we're having a fuller picture of, of what the statistics are. So I would you know, definitely be committed to trying to work on how do we solve that problem, whether it's by ordinance or whether it's just by trying to figure out a clearer way to correct the form so that we have a better reporting of it. Um, so great question, and it's definitely something I think that we can work to address. Okay. Do you want uh, any rebuttal time? No. No? no? Okay. So um, we are looking for our second set of questions. We still have about 10 minutes. Mary? Um, well, we can open it up to the audience then. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody have a question that they would like to ask? Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Everything's been fixed. <laughs> Are there more written questions over here? Yeah, there are. I'll ask a question. I'm a, I'm a teacher. Um, in, a, in a time when there are limited resources, what do you see the city's role? What, what can the city do to support a really strapped school district? And what do you see as some of the burning issues for our school district to deal with, given the limited resources we have? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think obviously the core, the key issue we have is, you know, how do we provide the best education that we can for all of our students? How do we provide, you know, quality instruction for all of our students? And that has to be kind of the core mission. Um, and in the context of the larger budget issues that we've been faced with, with reductions in state aid and and um, and the traditional school fundings that we get from the state. Um, as well as, you know, the increased costs in all the areas that we have to, you know, whether it's heating our buildings or paying health care for all of our city workers. Um, we've had this stress um, on how do we continue to provide that quality education with all these other economic stresses that we're under. So I think the challenge is going to be, um, part of it's going to be, uh, as, as the mayor, as a member of the school committee, um, trying to work collaboratively with the staff, with teachers, um, to figure out, we all share these same values, these same goals, you know, how can we work together to try to figure out how we deliver, you know, that education that we all want to deliver um, in a way so that people are able to earn a fair wage um, and we're able to, um, you know, not have large class sizes and just, you know, all the things that we're concerned about. Um, it's part of a larger issue of, you know, how do we address our, our budget in terms of how do we create um, more revenue, um, how are we, are, are there ways that we can deliver services more effectively, are there ways that we can do things regionally, uh, combine services to try to save money so that we can um, not waste money on administrative stuff and put it more directly on the front lines in terms of service delivery. Um, and then there's the, the discussion about economic development and, and how do we try to create more um, opportunities for not only small businesses to grow and to expand, but also to attract new businesses, which then gives us that additional revenue that we're not getting from the state. And it also means that we're not putting the burden on homeowners um, to, try to, to try to be able to fund all those services. We're spreading it between residential and commercial. So um, 
it's a it's a complicated issue, but I think part of it is always keeping our focus on that goal of how do we provide the best education possible. And we have a great you know community of parents. You know, I've been involved with NEF for a long time, and I know the PTOs are really strong at all the schools. So uh, there's also ways that we can try to collaborate, um, not just with government but also private as well, and try to try to work together to solve this issue. I'll give you a little extra time. That's okay. The, um, I think uh, the, t the two issues that are related that I uh, would start with is one is the budget, and I think we are looking at the budget and making sure that we're using all our resources as wisely as possible. And I would restructure the whole budgeting process. I would pull employees into the budget process to get ideas from them that has not been done in any systematic way. And I have heard from employees with their recommendations and their ideas. And sometimes the savings uh, may seem small, um, but I, th that can add up. And um, uh, as a former uh, educational employee, uh, it doesn't take uh, very much to add up to um, get the equal of a teacher's salary. So I, I think any uh, savings that we can do, um, we have that responsibility. Um, the, uh, the budgeting process is, is really key. And so that's the, uh, the first thing, making sure we're using our economic resources as wisely as we can. The other thing I would do is uh, look at ways of bringing in some new uh, revenue into the city. And um, I realize this is a very tight economic times. There are, there's no sort of magic uh, uh, bullet or magic pill that's going to uh, cure what we're facing. Um, but there are some ideas that I'm willing to move forward on, and one of the ideas is, is, is an, uh, an idea that uh, is being tried in Boston. Um, it's been talked about here, but never instituted as a program, and that's the, a payment in lieu of taxes. There are a number of institutions that do not have to pay taxes by state law on their property. And my initial work with the assessor's office is if we had um, a 10% um, uh, uh, of that revenue was, um, and again, this would be voluntary, um, was given to the city, it, it would very likely add up to over a million dollars. So there's another way of looking at uh, revenue. So those are the two of the things that I would do. But um, to me, the over, uh, kind of an overarching thing is there, is treating employees with uh, respect and dignity. Um, because we can go through some very tough economic times, but that is not an excuse for treating uh, employees with uh, disrespect. And I felt like there have been instances in the past where that has happened in, in the school system and elsewhere, and that just leads to uh, poor morale, low morale. And that is really a, um, a major problem, especially in educational institutions where the uh, the, the staff there feels that they are not being treated well. So um, regardless of how difficult the times are, I will be treating people with dignity and respect. Any anything else you'd like to add? No. So we're going to, you know, I think we have time for one more audience question. Audience question? Yes. Uh, where does your uh, view of individual responsibility and accountability fit into your concept of governing? I think Michael, you would be first the uh, uh, The concept of individual accountability. Um, well, I think accountability in general um, is a major uh, uh, um, part of governing. Um, it's something that I saw in the public schools is holding people accountable for what they are supposed to do within their, uh, their job responsibilities. Um, I managed a guidance department. I was uh, head of a guidance department. Um, I held the staff people accountable for, for the work they were supposed to be doing. I evaluated them regularly. Um, I got feedback from on folks about how well things were or were not going. Um, so I have done that, and I have been responsible for recommending people to be dismissed when they have not fulfilled their responsibilities. So um, I am uh, uh, very, I, I hold that as a very, very important role in terms of any type of organization. And, 
and when we're talking about um, public government, it is, a, uh, I think, a major uh, aspect of government. We need to be um, have our own standards, and then we need to be held ac accountable to the people that we're serving, which is the general public. And I have a track record of being a, a public servant. Um, I have always um, seen my mission is, is working with the needs of those who I'm supposed to be serving. And I've done that for 33 years. I worked with a lot of folks who did not want to be in a public school, you know, um, teenagers and their families. And I can, uh, um, they held me accountable and I held in terms of the people accountable and making things work for people. So I will, I will do that. Um, can you re the, the question was about the concept of individual responsibility. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I'll give it my best shot. And I, th I think what you're asking about is in terms of, you know, as as residents of the city or as citizens or members of a community, um, what individual responsibilities do we have in terms of whether it's following the law, whether it's paying our taxes, whether it's, uh, you know. Um, taking care of uh, things that, that uh, you know, again, just taking care of our family, those kinds of things. I, I, I think that's definitely important, but we're also, I think part of that also is being a member of a larger community, um, being part of a neighborhood, being part of a city, being part of a community. So there's definitely a role for individual responsibility, but I also feel that it's also part of that is, is your role in a larger community um, and, and your obligation to the community in terms of um, in terms of uh, you know working with people, um, uh, working on issues of shared interest, uh, you know we a lot of what we do in in, in the city when we're having an election next Tuesday. Um, some would view voting as an individual responsibility. It's also I think part of a shared community responsibility in terms of taking responsibility <laughs> for um, shaping the future of your government, um, and that includes also running, being willing to step forward. And to run for office, and to uh, and to be willing to serve maybe in, in other capacities for the city. So, I think individual responsibility is an important concept to look at. But I also feel that part of that is the community, what, what your role is in the larger community, and a lot of what we talk about as a city and the issues that we try to work on together. We're trying to do that as a community and come up with you know community consensus around issues. So, um, I guess that would be my my response. So we've come to the end of our time with with our candidates, um, and we'd like to thank you both for speaking, and thank you for the questions. And we are going to be inviting um, up uh, the well, um, first. We'd like to offer you each one minute closing. Oh, <laughs> or, I'm sorry. Two, two minutes. Two minutes. Sorry. Two, two minute minute closing. closing. <laughs> we keep carving we off keep time. Carving <laughs> two minutes. 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 Um, whose turn is it to start? You're keeping track of that, do you? Uh, I would. Yes. Okay. So, so, uh, <laughs> start we're, we're good at this. We've done this enough times. Okay. So. Okay. so again, I just want to thank uh, Casa Latina and Families with Power for sponsoring tonight's event. Um, again, I, I'm, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about the issues that, that are affecting your community, and, and it's been great to be all around the city, um, in different ward organizations, different organizations, the Florence Civic of Business, um, uh, Smith College, really hearing about the different issues that affect the, the various neighborhoods in our community. Um, I'm running for mayor because I want to keep Northampton strong and I want to try to make it better. Um, during my three terms on the city council, I've been a positive and productive representative and leader. I've never shied away from tough issues or hard work, and I've tried to bring people together to find innovative solutions uh, and tangible results to try to improve our community. Since announcing my candidacy, I've knocked on hundreds of doors and sat in dozens of kitchens and living rooms across the city, uh, listening and sharing my ideas and discussing my vision for how we can create more economic opportunity and jobs, keep our city livable and affordable, maintain strong public schools, deliver smart, cost-effective city services, protect our environment and keep Northampton green and sustainable, foster active neighborhood and civic participation, and lead a government 
<clears throat> that is open, fair, and transparent. Um, Northampton needs a mayor with a positive vision and a steady, proven track record of leadership and results. A mayor who will unite our city and work hard every day for all of its people to find innovative solutions to the challenges we face. I believe I'm the candidate with the experience, the qualifications, the ideas, the energy, and the commitment to offer a new generation of leadership to move our great city forward. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you tonight um, to answer your questions, and I look forward to sticking around afterwards if people have more specific questions. And I hope I can earn your vote on November 8th. Thank you very much. Again, I wish to uh, thank uh, the organizers of uh, this evening's forum and I, all the uh, audience members here for coming out and uh, listening uh, to us speak. Um, the, uh, this election is more than about the, uh, the two individuals uh, before you who are running for mayor. It is about the community we call Northampton. And it is about the people, all the people who live in this community. It is about the issues we face now and that we will face as a community in the future. It is about what we cherish and value about this community. It is about the changes that we want this community to go through and what we want it to look like in the future. For the first time in 12 years, there is a vacancy in the position of mayor. You, the voters, are the employers. In addition to examining the, the resumes and uh, the, you need to look at the experience, the career experiences, and the leadership qualifications of the candidates before you. You must assess which of us has the understanding of the changes that we are facing. As I said two years ago, I believe that the single most challenging uh, issue facing Northampton is the fact that for working and middle class individuals and families, Northampton is becoming an increasingly challenging, difficult place to live. And unless we talk about that and address that, the face of Northampton, Northampton as a community, will look very, very different in 10 15, 20 years. I think recent events nationwide have shown that. Northampton is well positioned to be a role model community in dealing with economic and environmental challenges. I have a clear understanding of our community and its potential and what we could be doing to remain vibrant, diverse as we move into increasingly difficult times I ask for your support on Election Day. Thank you.